Okay, uh, so welcome to our third and final panel of the day, um, titled Historians of the Future. Um, so just as a disclaimer, I, I think this goes without saying, uh, this is a topic that's really important to me, uh, both as a, you know, a Canadian, a Nova Scotian, a historian, and a future educator. I'm currently entering um, the second year of my B.Ed. We have a teacher on our panel, and you know these contributions are important. Um, so that's my preamble, my introduction. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our panelists, read a little bit of their abstracts because we do have some time, and uh, then we're good to go. Um, and save any questions you have for the end. We're aiming for to have time. Okay. So, um, first we have Evan Jenix. He's a graduate student at Dalhousie uh, studying post-war black Nova Scotian activism, uh, a resident of Wolfville. Evan currently works at the Wolfville Historical Society during the summer months. He's also an amateur surfer in his free time and hoping uh, to get into scuba diving. So, more active than I am. <laughs> also, he is, I should, Ad, he's studying under uh, our principal investigator, Dr. Afua Cooper. Um, so this research he's working on is currently in the process of being completed at Dalhousie University uh, as part of his uh, master's uh, requirements uh, under the guidance of Dr. Cooper. The ultimate goal of his research is to provide accessible information pertaining to the BUF and ACLM of Nova Scotians and to highlight the role in no Nova Scotia black activism. Uh, and black activism across Canada. Um, while this research, research focuses entirely on black activism in Nova Scotia, this material aims to contribute to modern and future discussions of African Canadian history, arts, and culture by analyzing the role of the state recognition in black activism for self-determination through the BUF and ACLM. In this regard, this research will discuss how to uh, pass how past interactions with state recognition to achieve self-determination inform modern processes. So that's gonna be a really good presentation. Um, I'm gonna introduce the other panelists oh. first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're very eager to present, I love this. Uh, next, quickly, is Bashir Mohammed. Uh, he's a writer and researcher focusing on black Albertan history. His main area of work is a history of discrimination towards black Albertans along with local black residents. His work has appeared in the Canadian Encyclopedia, CBC, Star Metro, and The Guardian. During his free time, he loves cycling and spending time in the archives. Right on Bashir. Um, <laughs> uh, an interactive presentation showcasing his research on black anti-black racism and black resistance in Alberta. His presentation will be a primer that will introduce participants to Albert, the Albertan context and how the legacy of his history shapes uh, the modern black experience in Alberta. We will, he will discuss events such as the rise of the Ku Klux Klan segregation and civil rights figures such as Lulu Anderson and Charles Daniel. And then next, and our last panelist is uh, my friend, Robin Brown. We went to graduate school here at Dalhousie together. Uh, she's a Dartmouth High-based uh, high school teacher, teaching uh, with 15 years teaching experience in the classroom. She holds a BA in History and Early Modern Studies, a Bachelor of Education, a Master's of Education with specialization, specialization in French as a second language, an MA in Canadian history, and is currently enrolled in an MA in education at MSVU, specializing in curriculum studies. That's a lot of school. <laughs> Her current research interests focus on gender and social studies and curricula. Robin teaches Canadian history, global history, and African Canadian studies to both English and French immersion students. So a little bit about her her presentation. Uh, using archival material is a standard practice at the university level, yet the holdings of museums as well as archives of Nova Scotia house a wealth of information that can be readily accessed by students at the secondary level. Court cases, newspapers, land documents, as well as other material items can help tell the story of African Canadians in a way that is tangible to students, allowing them to make concrete connections to the past that is often overlooked. Uh, this material, which is slowly being digitized at the local level and international levels, uh, opens new opportunities for students to access this digital information 
Uh, her presentation will consider how teachers could use digitized uh, materials um, while incorporating current pedagogical practices in the field of uh, social studies education. So, now we're moving on to our panels. Uh, first up, we have Evan. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be bending down a little bit. Hopefully, you can hear me well um, in the microphone. Uh, I want to say um, a big thank you to everyone who's listening to me talk today. Um, this is my first time speaking at a conference, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I also want to give a big, huge thank you for Dr. Cooper, not only for organizing this event and having us all here, but also being uh, a really extremely influential and really incredible person with my master's research as my direct supervisor for this. Um, the title, uh, working title of my master's thesis research, which I'm going to be presenting to you today, is uh, He Who Is Reluctant to Recognize Me Opposes Me, Self-Determination, Recognition, and Revolution Between the Black United Front, the Afro-Canadian Liberation Movement, and the Canadian State. Um, that quote uh, that I use at the, at the beginning of my uh, title is from Franz Fernand's uh, Black Skin, White Masks. Uh, a famous black philosophical piece that came out in the mid-20th century that I'll be discussing a little bit later. Uh, first and foremost, um, just to, to kind of give us all the, the, the groundwork we need to know for my research, uh, what is Buff and, and, and what is the ACLM? Um, so as uh, post-war Canada is, is developing, um, a, lot, a lot of people would argue that, that, that Buff is the result of uh, civil rights influences from the states and elsewhere in Canada. I personally would argue that it's, it's much more homegrown than that. Uh, so as the 1960s are evolving, the man who you see in the top right hand corner of that slide, uh, Rocky Jones, is becoming a, uh, a large civil rights activist who's speaking in Toronto, he's speaking in Montreal, um, and in 1968 uh, is, is somewhat involved with the, with the Montreal school riot that ends up happening there as well, uh, where um, black Caribbean students were being discriminated against, um, which, which caused a, a confrontation on, on campus in Montreal. Um, so there's, there's a growing um, frustration with, with state reactions and, and state interactions with black communities across Nova Scotia. And uh, November 30th of 1968, uh, a black family meeting is held uh, in North End Halifax, uh, where over 500 black Nova Scotians, uh, mostly Halifax residents, meet to discuss um, how they want to move forward with state relations. And what ends up uh, coming out of that meeting is an interim committee, um, which has Rocky Jones as, a, as an interim committee uh, member, as well as Will and Pearlie Oliver, who's in the bottom left-hand corner of that slide. Um, they, uh, as well as other big community members, end up becoming part of this interim committee uh, for the Black United Front. Um, it's established as an umbrella organization that would help the establishment or to help uh, already establish black organizations across the province um, demand uh, recognition and demand uh, self-determination from both the Nova Scotia government and the federal government as well. Uh, shortly after uh, its creation in 1969, uh, Rocky Jones, uh, while he's away, he discusses in his autobiography that William Pearlie Oliver approaches the federal government about funding for the Black United Front. Um, the federal government agrees to fund the Black United Front on a, on a five-year program for $500,000 between 1969 and 1974. Rocky Jones is not very happy with that decision. Uh, he is, uh, at the time, he's kind of viewed much more radical. He's, he's described as being militant um, in his approach, and he is not at all um, uh, positive towards this, this state funding. And he argues that through state funding of Buff, that there's going to be a certain level of state control as to where the, like, where the organization is going to go. Uh, he steps away from Buff and he ends up uh, creating the ACLM, the Afro-Canadian Liberation Movement, uh, which functions for the, during the early 1970s. Buff uh, then uh, takes that money, that, that federal money, it has it until 1974, until the provincial government becomes the primary funding uh, agency for, the, uh, for Buff uh, between 1974 through till the, it's, it's uh, disillusion in uh, 1996. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on to my next slide, uh, what I call the, the foundational years of Buff as an organization. 
uh, which is between 1970 and 1973. Uh, this map I created myself of all the different organizations during this time that were either created or uh, brought back as organizations uh, that had previously been created to fall under this Buff organization. And the first executive director of Buff, uh, Jules Oliver, who's the son of William Perley Oliver, uh, he approaches his position with this mindset of the more community, uh, like grassroots organizations we can have across the province, the more we can pressure the federal government for additional funding for certain projects. Uh, so all of these numbered um, uh, groups that you see along the bottom are all community-specific organizations uh, in which Buff had four field, organizations, uh, field organizers at the time who would go between these communities uh, help them establish themselves, help them, uh, help them create uh, grants for the government, um, and help them pressure uh, government organizations for funding for their specific communities. Uh, the organizations I have listed in the top left corner of that image uh, are all province-wide organizations. The one I'm going to highlight here for us is the very first one, Blacks Unite for More Money, or their acronym was BUMM, B-U-M-M. -M. Uh, they uh, were trying to pressure the federal government for specifically economic money to, to help uh, create black businesses and uh, that would be employing black uh, Nova Scotians all across the province. Um, and they specifically have a very hard time getting that funding from the, from the federal government. And I argue that during this period, especially with the way the federal government is approaching Buff at this time, um, the Trudeau uh, administration, Pierre Trudeau's administration in funding Buff in 1969 refused to fund uh, the organization through anything else besides welfare. They viewed it as a welfare organization. Uh, so when it came to funding uh, each of these communities, um, they would give them grant money uh, for welfare-based projects. But larger uh, organizations like, uh, like Black Un Blacks Unite for More Money uh, that were trying to attack like economic disparity and, and economic races in the province, the federal government was unwilling to give them money at the time. Uh, I then uh, kind of transitioned to a different section where in 1973, Jules Oliver leaves as executive director. Uh, and the new executive director that comes in uh, is a man named Hamid Rashid. Uh, or it's his picture on the left here, he's still called Art, uh, Art Chris at the time. He ends up changing his name um, through his tenure as the executive director. And he himself kind of uh, argues that Buff at this time is becoming a new organization. Uh, the reports that he's doing uh, at the beginning of his time as the executive director are showing that there's still a lot of economic disparity, a lot of educational di uh, disparity and, and racism having cross happening across the province. And he views the, uh, the multitude of uh, community-specific organizations as, um, as potentially not being the best direction for Buff at the time. And he kind of views a more centralized uh, organization as being more impactful in in pressuring the federal government for change on these matters, um, which he details in uh, the GRASP publication of the time. Uh, GRASP is the, is the primary resource that I use because it's uh, the, the newspaper publication that they were pr producing at the time for black communities. So one of the major um, questions I'm aiming to answer throughout my research is what is the state relationship with Buff and how does that change throughout the course of uh, the, the organization's existence? Um, so off the top, I was talking about Black Skins, White Masks by Franz Fanon. Uh, in a weird way, I'm, I'm, I'm using that as a, as a resource, but I'm also using Glenn Couthard's uh, piece, Red Skins, White Masks, where Glenn Couthard kind of took Franz Fanon's approach uh, and then adopted it to the way indigenous groups are starting to interact with the Canadian state. Um, I'm then kind of taking Glenn, C C Glenn Couthard's uh, work and kind of bringing it back to specifically Black uh, Canadians. Um, Glenn Cuckard, uh, he argues that um, meaningful and, and actual recognition for Indigenous people across Canada uh, is not achieved through uh, the federal government. It's achieved through grassroots organizations and grassroots things. Um, he kind of argues that if you're going to try to change the status quo, um, the federal government as an organization is always trying to keep and establish the status quo. Um, so it's not willing to create the change that is necessary. Uh, so in that really, like, how does the state kind of uh, interact with Buff? How does it shape the way the organization is unfolding? How does it impact the direction that the organization is taking? 
Um, I discussed a little earlier about how the federal government was unwilling to fund Buff as anything other than a welfare organization. And I kind of argue through my research that that has big implications to how um, racism and, and, and how racial di discrimination is addressed at this time uh, in the province. Um, we're all aware as, as scholars that racism is something that's much deeper, especially in Nova Scotia, um, than being a welfare-based issue. Uh, and so um, there's the emergence and there's a lot of people writing into the Grass publication talking about how they're able to go to New Glasgow and they're not, uh, there isn't the same legal uh, barriers as there once was, but the mindsets of, of Nova Scotians are still the same as they were before. And the federal government's approach isn't really actively changing that as much as they're hoping for. Um, the little quote I have down at the bottom of this slide is actually from The Wrap, which was a later publication created by the Black Native Front in the 1980s. And at this time, uh, a man named Gerald Taylor is the, uh, is the executive director. And he talks about how at this time they're funded through the Nova Scotia Department of Social Services. Uh, this is after federal funding has, has ended and they, they get their funding through the provincial government. Um, and he kind of talks about how they're having a major issue in terms of how much money they're receiving from the, from the, the provincial government. Uh, he says, this funding limits us to having a skeleton staff, and we have nine employees for the whole province, um, which was a big difference from, from the earlier days of Buff. And I also argue that the provincial government, because the provincial government moves to a system in which every single year Buff has to renew uh, a grant. It's only like a yearly program they're supplied with. It's not the same as the five-year program they have with the federal government, um, which creates implications for how much progress you can create uh, having to every single year reapply for, for funding. Um, I also ask, uh, through my research, um, how Buff is influenced by post-war Canadian identity. Um, a big mandate for Buff was the, uh, the celebration and the focus on, on black culture in Nova Scotia and uh, highlighting through conferences and, 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 uh, and festivals across the province, uh, different black history, black excellence, black identity, black culture. Um, and I kind of look at T.H. Marshall's uh, work where he kind of discusses in, in the post-war world, um, we have this kind of changing emotion of, what's, of what uh, uh, citizenship is and what social class is. Um, and I look more specifically in the Canadian context at Tina Liu's recent book, Moved by the State, where she looks at Africville and she looks at how in post-war Canada, the 1960s, uh, the Canadian state is starting to look at social citizenship as this positive thing of, well, every single Canadian needs to have the same access to social welfare. Um, but what actually ends up coming out of that, and, and as we all know if, if you studied Africville history, is, is this forced intervention by the state on communities that removes their culture, removes their history, and removes um, their identity as, as a specific group. So a lot of the issue Buff is having at the time is that they're trying to create uh, a mandate where they're promoting black identity and, and promoting black culture across the province, um, where both the state and white Nova Scotians are responding, well, why don't we have a Dutch united front? Why do we need to focus on, on, on black uh, identity? Like, it, you should be a Canadian first and then, and, and, and your black identity should be second. And there's kind of this struggle where black is, or where the Black Native Front is trying to um, accurately present um, black identity across the province and in black communities as well. But first and, uh, and foremost, above all that, as, as a master's research, um, I really want to present Buff accurate, uh, accurately and positively. Um, I found doing research that there are publications that have been written before on the Black United Front. Um, but if you ask the average um, you know, student in any high school in, uh, across the province, um, it's something that I feel like should be included in their curriculum, but it's really sadly lacking, um, especially for black students across the province. Um, I really want my research to highlight um, this is a really powerful and, and, and really moving uh, civil rights organization that had really huge uh, impacts on, on, on black power across Nova Scotia. Um, I really like this quote from Ebony Magazine that was republished in Grasp at the time in 1972 um, that I'll read out to you, in which they say, a black man or a black woman coping with an impossible situation by rearing children and creating a strong black family uh, life is black power. A teacher stretching the minds of children and expanding their horizons 
is black power. A student getting his head and soul together is black power. An institution guided and controlled by blacks within the perspective of the strengthening of the total black community is black power. A child saved is black power. Something put away for an emergency, something given in love to support a black institution, something ventured, something wagered in defense of black manhood or black womanhood, these things, all of them, are, th are, th are the foundations of power, and they are all within your realm of responsibility. Uh, so feeding into that, first and foremost, um, I want this to be uh, a project and something that can be promoting uh, to black youth across the province to view the history of this organization as black power um, and as something that they can look back at, and especially as we move forward with the Black Lives Matter movement as a, as a positive historical um, something that, that, that they can relate to and, and something that they can bring forward to, uh, to the modern generation. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. So my presentation is very visual, so if you want to see the images, you're more than welcome to uh, move forward. So my name is Bashir. Uh, my day job is I am a naval officer based in Victoria, but on the side, I do a lot of research uh, in the archives and a lot of black Canadian uh, history research. Um, so about me, I was born in Nairobi, Kenya in 1994 to family Somali refugees. I was born stateless, which meant I had no citizenship to any country, and in 97, February 12th, 1997, my family got asylum to come to Canada. For some reason, they put us in Edmonton, and when we landed, it was winter, and I remember stepping out of the airport, and my mom, sorry, my sister, um, the one on the left, she convinced me that snow was sugar. So I <laughs> put in my backpack and it melted, and that was my first ever Canadian experience. Um, so yeah, since then, I did uh, all my schooling in Edmonton, elementary to university. And uh, throughout that time, I didn't really learn anything about black Albertan history. So let's just jump straight into cowboys, you know, Alberta cowboys. So line dancing is in our curriculum. Like, we learn how to line dance, we learn the Cadillac Ranch, but black Alberta history isn't. So when you Google cowboys, you get this image, you know, like mostly white cowboys. But in reality, uh, there, were, there were a lot of black cowboys in America, but also in Canada. So in addition to images like this, we should also be seeing images like this and this. One famous black cowboy is John Ware. He was one of the main influences for the Calgary Stampede. If you want to read more about him, uh, Cheryl Fogo has done a lot of good work on him. And if you flew on Air Canada, you can watch her documentary on the flight back home. Um, I, I mention him because uh, the way he was honored was kind of messed up. So the government named a ridge after him, and they um, named the ridge N-word John Ridge using the hard R. And this lasted up until the 1970s. And this was pretty consistent across Canada. Uh, there's a lot of places across Canada that use the N-word as geographical names. Uh, so these names are all rescinded. Uh, these names are still official because I guess Negro is a softer version of the N-word, along with these names too. And I just say this to kind of uh, show uh, a little bit of the legacy before I begin. So let's talk about um, other refugees. Um, so when I started going into the archives, and the reason I went to the archives was people told me uh, we don't have this history, um, you know, Alberta's different, Canada's different, things are different here. I wanted to know if that was true. Um, so I learned about other refugees, like the wave of black immigration that came into Alberta in the early 1900s. The Alberta government advertised uh, people to come, but they weren't expecting black people, but black people came. So when I saw these photos, it was very emotional, you know, as a black kid growing up in Edmonton, in my 20s, uh, seeing these images of people who were here before me, uh, in rural Alberta. So they settled in uh, rural communities like Amber Valley and Keystone, but a lot of them also settled in Edmonton and Calgary and also lived very urban lives. Uh, this is uh, Parson Sneed. He was one of the uh, uh, early settlers. He said, we come to the sunny Alberta not as peons, not as a subject race, but to subject ourselves only to the laws of Canada and its province. We do not have to be kept on the farms. We are law abiding. We feel our gentlemen and ladies are able to compete with the white ladies and gentlemen of this country. We deny the charge that we must be kept in the farms to make good. We cross the boundary not asking for anything but loyal citizenship. And this was a political cartoon uh, printed in response to him. Um, so Edmonton Journal, 1911. It's a messed up cartoon in the background. Uh, so that's, there's a border, background's the US, and you see uh, 
white people chasing black people, and then black people hanging from a lynching and running to the border. And the Canadian border official is saying, poor fellow, you couldn't stand the cold. You can write an essay and give like an entire course on how coldness was used to deny uh, black immigration. Um, but yeah, and you could see on the suitcase it says sunny Alberta, so directly from his speech. So there's a lot of opposition. Uh, petitions were organized against black immigration. Uh, this was printed in the Edmonton Journal called We Want No Dark Spots in Alberta. It begins by saying, like the province of British Columbia being called Yellow British Columbia, our own province might be called Black Alberta, and therefore I think the time has come when immigration should be made a subject of personal control. So they talk about three classes of people, and the first class is like the ideal immigrants, the second class are people they don't really like but will take, so like Ukrainians, for example. And then the third class, I'll read it, the third class, and here I can refer to Alberta being called Black Alberta, we do not want to have this name attached to us, nor do we want to have the province black in spots. Uh, there's also fear of black men, um, like black men being a danger to white women. So here it says, Fireside would like to know what the people think about the Negro invasion that is now pouring into the Canadian West and farming large settlements contingents to and among the whites. There can scarcely be anyone who is not aware of the atrocities committed by members of these terrible communities, the only corresponding punishment for which is the lawless lynching. Already it is reported that three white women in Edmonton and Peace River districts have been victims of these outrages, accomplished and peculiarly fiendish abandon. Where will the end be? So a lot of suffragette groups, uh, labor unions, and city councils uh, petition against black immigration. And they were ultimately successful uh, at halting the wave of immigration. But there are still a ton of black people in Alberta. So they couldn't just like deport them, they tried. Um, so what barriers did they face? Well, a lot of segregation. This is Borden Park now. It's a park on the east side of Edmonton. In uh, 19, the 1920s, 1924, it was a public swimming pool. It had a roller coaster that looked kind of sketchy in the back. And uh, yeah, uh, when it was opened, it was segregated. And black families organized to remove that barrier. So this is from the Edmonton Bulletin. Negro citizens appeal order barring them from city pool. Protest is registered and letter forwarded to council. Forbidding racists to swim together smacks of Klu Klanism, they say. And they were successful. They actually removed the ban, but then a bunch of white residents got together and the ban was re-implemented. Uh, the logic being, and I'll just read it. It is not conceivable that any white person, especially a white woman, will use the polls if they are to come into contact with a black man there. It is not a question of superiority or race, but there is a line of distinction between the white and black races that cannot be bridged. So they re-implemented the ban. Uh, minstrel shows are also very common in Alberta. So here are some uh, newspaper articles talking about minstrel shows. And I want to show images because images are important. Like, in, with black Albertan history, well, when we think of American civil rights, we think of images, right? We think of Rosa Parks sitting on the bus, we think of Martin Luther King, we think of segregated water fountains. Those th same things happen in Alberta, but we don't have those images. Or we do, but they're rather destroyed or hard to get. So these are images of minstrel performers in Alberta. So this is the Kiwanis Club Minstrel Show, Edmonton, 1935. Rotary Minstrel Show, Calgary, 1919. Rotary Minstrels, Edmonton, 1921. And Minstrel Show in Drumheller, Alberta, 1945. Uh, this image is probably the best way to cap the first half of my talk. So this is Gibson Block. It's a flat iron building in downtown Edmonton. Now it's a women's shelter, but back in the day, it used to be a hotel. If you look at the back of the building, you can see like, these really old advertisements on the right. It's like Pepsi and the Edmonton Journal. But on the left, there's a white box. And I was always curious what was in that white box. And if you look at old photos, you see that there was something there. And I eventually found an illustration that drew the back of the building. And this was there. Gibson Cafe, open all night, best service, friendly people, white help only. So we literally kept the parts of our history that we like, and we and we whitewash the parts we don't like. And actually, if you look, um, there was, sorry, let me go back. The uh, journal ad isn't even there. So they, they added something to it. And I think that's really interesting, signifies how Alberta remembers this history. Uh, let's talk about the Klan. Uh, the Klan was popular um, in Alberta. This guy, J.J. Maloney, he founded the Alberta Klan. And he wanted this guy, Daniel Knott, to be mayor of Edmonton. 
and he was successful. In 1931, Daniel Knott became mayor of Edmonton. And to celebrate, the Klan lit a cross on Connors Hill. And this is a photo of the cross burning uh, that was printed in the Edmonton Journal. And they wrote letters back and forth. So you can see, like, nice of the Ku Klux Klan, Alberta. So in this letter, they're asking to hold a cross burning at Northlands, which is like um, a little bit north in Edmonton. And these letters go back and forth. And the fire chief said, while not interested in the Klan or, or its doings, yet as fire chief, I think it is right to call attention to the danger of any fire being lit on the exhibition grounds. The mayor responded by approving the cross burning on one condition. He said, um, this permit is granted on the understanding that no smoking will be allowed, which is insane. Anyways, so he, he approved the cross burning. And uh, Maloney, he, he, uh, he kept spreading his message. He would give these speeches called free speech specials. Here, here's one that he gave, and you can see the banner in the back. Direct parallels to what's happening now with the alt-right and, and the far right, and how they use free speech to spread their message. This is a photo, a photo of a Klan gathering. And if you look, they're holding up copy, copies of the Liberator, which was the KKK's newspaper in Alberta. And on the headline, it says, free speech is upheld. A side note, when you think about the Klan, a lot of people think about you know, angry old white dudes in hoodies. Uh, but in reality, like, this was the face of the Klan, relatively normal looking people. And uh, the Klan had a few iterations, but the final iteration finally ended in 2003. Uh, the Klan was formally incorporated as a society in the province of Alberta. This is the Certificate of Incorporation. And if you read the name, it says, Invisible Empire Association of Alberta, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And you see the Alberta government logo on the bottom right. So they were de-incorporated in 2003. And it wasn't because someone was like, wait a minute, that's messed up. In 2001, they just stopped filing financial records. So two years later, they were decertified. So how did black Albertans resist against the Invisible Empire? So the Klan called themselves the Invisible Empire because they realized their power didn't come from like public loud support. It came from the complacency and general indifference of the general public hence Invisible Empire. Well, there's a few stories. Uh, so this is Peter Lougheed, Premier of Alberta. His granddad, uh, Senator Lougheed, owned a uh, theater in downtown Calgary. And in, 19, uh, in 1914, Charles Daniel, a black Calgarian, wanted to watch a play. And he was thrown out. And this is from the Calgary Herald. Calgary N-word, they use the hard R in the headline, kicks up fuss wants to attend theater with white folk, but management say no. So it became like a super long court case, and he actually won. Um, so this is the headline saying that he won. So it gets damages from Calgary Playhouse. Negro was refused admission to performance at Sherman Grand Theater. However, somehow it went back to court because th the reason he won was the theater's lawyers didn't show up, so he won by default. So the theater's lawyers managed to reopen the case, and then World War I happened, and then there's no record of the case actually ending. So we don't actually know how the case actually ended. Lulu Anderson was a black woman who did the same thing in Edmonton in 1922. So uh, this is downtown Edmonton, and this is where the Metropolitan Theater was. And yeah, she wanted to watch a film and was thrown out, physically thrown out. And um, yeah, her case uh, was very popular in Edmonton. A lot of people knew about it. This article is from the Winnipeg Free Press, color line confirmed. Alberta courts have decided that a colored woman has no legal redress if a theater refuses her admission, even though she holds a ticket for a reserved seat. Judge Dubot in a recent Edmonton case held that the management of a theater could refuse admission to anyone upon tendering the price of the ticket. Ms. Lulu Anderson sued a local theater for damages because she was refused, en because she was refused entry because she was colored. So I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to learn about her. I wanted to find a photo of her, because this happened 20 years before Viola Desmond. Charles Daniels thing happened the same year Viola Desmond was born. So I wanted to learn more about these people, because they deserve to be honored. This year is 100 years since Lulu's case. And I found this immigration slip. It showed that Lulu was 37 in 1922, so probably 30, uh, 1923, so probably 36 <laughs> in 1922. Uh, she lived near Boyle Street, which is like in the inner city in Edmonton. And yeah, I found that she was very active in her church. She sung in her church choir. And I found a photo of her. But th there's a big uh, star beside that, because I don't know who she is in this photo. Um, 
this is her church congregation uh, from 1921. So unless she, she was sick, she, she's in this photo, but there's no names or anything listed. And I remember how bittersweet it was. Like I was staring at this photo for so long trying to find a way to identify the names, and I could only identify a few names, and none of them were Lulu. So yeah, I, I felt two emotions. I felt sad that we couldn't find an image to honor this person who did this amazing thing 100 years ago, but also a little happy because this was her community. These were the people who stood by her during that court case. In the face of the city literally being run by the Klan, she chose to stand up and say no. She wasn't the only one. There's a lot of stories, a lot of names. I could, I could create a whole class about uh, this topic. Um, so in the background, you can see the Rural Alexander, Ho Alexander Hospital. In 1938, a woman named uh, uh, Ruma Utendel wanted to be a nurse uh, at the Rural Alexander Hospital. hospital but she was refused admission uh, to nursing school. And this is an op-ed actually talking about uh, that incident. I've been in it, and it's, this person's anonymous, but I assume they're a white person, um, just because of the context and because of like the columns that, during that time. And they say, I have been in another country for the past two weeks. They have a racial problem about the, wit the handling of which Canadians can wax righteously indignant Share hypocrisy, most of it. We talk about racial equality, and when it gets down to cases, we react just the same as the people we condemn. A very fine Negro girl made application to train as a nurse in our publicly owned hospital in Edmonton a few years ago. She was at first accepted because there was no excuse not to accept her. She had every qualification, and she greatly wanted to be a nurse. And then our boasted Canadian racial tolerance came to trial and failed miserably. Because she was colored, uh, the girl was denied the right to the career she longed to enter. Question. Might she have been better off under the segregation employed in the southern states? At least there she could have become a nurse, trained in a Negro hospital. We denied her that chance. Again, uh, uh, Ruma is also not honored in Edmonton in any way. Uh, there's also Ted King and Violet King who are siblings. Ted King is the one in the, in the middle. He, this is a photo of him returning from uh, World War II. He led the Alberta Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He launched a civil rights case in Calgary against a motel that refused entry to black people. And then there's Violet King on the right. She's the first black woman to be a lawyer in Canada, uh, the first black person to be a lawyer in Alberta. And uh, her daughter's still alive. Uh, her daughter's coming to Alberta in August. So I can also write essays about these two people. And uh, yeah, I, I remember when I wrote about Ted King, his, his son reached out to me. And his own son was unaware that his father launched the civil rights case in Calgary. That was a super big deal. Um, so it just goes to show, like, these people, like, they weren't doing it for fame. They were doing it because it was right. And this is a photo of Ted King and his, and his wife. So when you think about the legacy, uh, if you walk through the graduating uh, uh, photos of nursing students, you don't really see a black face until, like, the 70s or 80s. And this is a clear result of policies, uh, either formal or informal, that barred black people, that upheld the invisible empire. And I want to end with this uh, quote by James Baldwin. History, as nearly no one seems to know, is not something to be read, and it does not refer, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It can scarcely be, other, it can scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of references our identities and our aspirations. And it is with great pain and terror that one begins to realize this. In great pain and terror, one begins to assess the history which has placed one where one is and formed one's point of view. In great pain and terror, because therefore, one enters into battle with the historic creation, oneself, and attempts to recreate oneself according to a principle more humane and more liberating. One begins the attempt to achieve a level of personal maturity and freedom which robs history of its tyrannical power, but also changes history. James Baldwin in Ebony, August 1965. Thank you, and a minute and a half to spare. So I'm good. So uh, as Dana mentioned, in real life, I am a high school teacher. I've been teaching social studies and French language arts for 15 years. And 
I wanted to talk to you folks today about the importance of using archival material at the secondary level. Um, this is something that came about through the past couple of years in my teaching experience, and it's something that I really feel very passionate about because using archival material puts primary sources into kids' hands, sources that are indisputable, that are tangible, and that really can help kids learn about their history uh, if they happen to be an African Nova Scotian or a black Canadian student, or if they happen to be a white student, they can learn that black history is in fact Canadian history. It is not something that is other, it is part of the fabric of our historical narrative as a province and our historical narrative as a nation. So, uh, as a, just to start off, um, I did write a land acknowledgement. We did do one earlier, but you know, whatever. So first off, um, I'd like to say that we are in Chibuktuk, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and that we are all treaty people, and we walk in friendship, and hopefully learning with the Mi'kmaq people. So, it seems so weird to be at a conference in person, doesn't it? It's been so long. My story today starts about two years ago as the, well, two and a half almost now, as the world came to a grinding halt. I'm an early modernist, so as COVID became a thing in the spring of 2020, uh, I knew. I knew that this was not going to be a short, a short gig. And I also knew that this was going to change how I teach and how my kids learn and what sources I use in the classroom. Because as maybe we all remember, or maybe we've been successful in blocking it out. Everything closed down. We had to change how we teach. We went from being in front of our kids face to face, having those personal interactions with them, to the Zoom screen, the boxes. Do you know? Yeah, we all know what I mean. Sometimes there'd be a little icon, maybe you'd see a face, but other than that, you were just teaching to the void. So part of what kind of spurred me uh, was the fact that now I had some time, because where else was I going to go? Nowhere. I had nowhere to be, nothing to do besides work. Uh, that I really started to explore what there was with regard to digital sources for my kids, because everything I was going to be using in classroom, I had to be able to post online. Libraries, archives, museums were also in the same boat, because they had no patrons. They had no one coming to see their collections, so they then started to digitize. And somewhere in this horrible experience of COVID, this beautiful event of mass digitization of archival documents happened, which meant that museums and collections beforehand that would have been simply out of reach because of geography or uh, maybe language barriers or just the plethora of reasons why we can't access a source, those were taken down. And this meant that kids could now interact with sources in a different way. All right, sorry, here. Oh no, it's my fault, sorry, my, uh, it, my Chromebook, my iPad flipped shut. So, as all of this is going on, We've got digitization, we've got different sources becoming available. We've also got the radical social change that's going on now, okay? We've got the murder of George Floyd that happens in May of 2020, the then fallout because of this crime, and the global reaction. We see that white supremacy has now come back out of the woodwork. It's always been there, but it jumped right on out and did a dance in front of the world. And this continued on right even this past winter with the uh, presence of white supremacists at the Freedom Convoy protests in Ottawa. So this highlights the fact that we need to work on combating and disrupting anti-black racism and white supremacy. And we've got this situation where archival documentation is now available. So these two things can now find a merging point and we can start to dismantle 
white supremacy and anti-black racism by looking at its root. And we can now put these sources in front of kids so they themselves can see that this isn't something that's brand new because a man was brutally murdered and it was captured on video, that this is something that dates back hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's not until we face our past that we can really move forward and move forward in a protective way where all members of our society have a fair and equal share and a promising future, which is something that everyone deserves. So this then now started to inform my classroom practice and that's what I wanted to share with folks today. So Dana, I'm assuming I just use the arrows. There we go. All right. So one of the ways in which I help kids kind of unpack anti-black racism is by looking at archival material. And this is one that I actually use in my class. This is a fugitive slave ad from Nova Scotia. So first and foremost, by using a document like this, it puts f slavery front and center in Nova Scotia. This particular one is from Falmouth, just outside of Windsor. So this is a 35 minute drive from where my kids sit in my classroom. Can folks, can we see that kind of? A little bit, okay, so I'll just do a quick read over it. So, this day ran away from Abel Mishner, Esquire, a man named James, about five feet, eight inches in height, well made, 23 years of age, with a smooth face and lively countenance, had on when he went away a blue homespun cloth coat with blue blaze, hold on, lining, sorry, and black horn buttons, striped flannel waistcoat and homespun woolen breeches, black and white milled, white stockings and a pair of moccasins. He also had on a light color homespun great coat. He took with him a brass mounted fusee. Whoever will apprehend and secure the said person and any of his majesty's gals, for that his master may have him again, shall be entitled to five pounds reward and all necessary charges paid. Masters of vessels and others are cautioned not to harbor, conceal, or carry off said person. And then there's an NB. If said James will return to his master, he shall be forgiven. Now, one skill that high school students have because of investments in literacy education in Nova Scotia is they can read a nonfiction text. And this is precisely what a document like this is. It's a nonfiction text. So using the kids' pre-existing literacy skills, you can unpack this and you can break it down. And the reason why I like using this particular one is that we can learn a lot about James. Okay, first off, we know his general height, his complexion. So seems like a weird thing, but by seeing that he's got a smooth complexion, we know he hasn't had smallpox because he hasn't had that disfiguring illness. We can tell roughly what his nutrition level is going to be because of his body shape, you know, well made, roughly his height. He's pretty much an average size for the time. But the part that my kids find fascinating about this particular ad is this line at the bottom. If, said, if the said James shall be returned to his master, he shall be forgiven. I'm just gonna throw it out there like you guys are in my class. What seems odd about that? Who is that line written to? It's written to James. So what does that tell us about James? He can read. So this in and of itself changes how we think about slave narratives in Nova Scotia. James likely isn't illiterate. James can read. James has been able to do the one act of protest that enslaved people have by removing himself, his labor, this is the ultimate act of resistance. So James, he's a strong man. He's got people looking for him. He's got a reward on his head, but he is still willing to try and to fight back in this one tangible way that he can mount a resistance. Another particular one that I like to use, this again is from the Nova Scotia Gazette and Weekly Chronicle. For those who don't know, this was the major local in the Halifax area from about the, it was in that form from about the 18, uh, seven, sorry, 18, 1770s to about 
the 1810s. It was owned by the same printer. Um, this particular ad um, is for a woman named Thursday. So Thursday, again, she had run away from John Rock uh, on the 18th day of August last, at about four and a half feet high, broad set with a lump above her right eye. Had on her when she ran a red cloth petticoat, a red, ba red baize bed gown, and a red ribbon about her head. Whoever may harbor said girl, and or encourage her to flee, uh, stay away from her said master, may depend on being prosecuted according as the law shall direct, and whoever may be so kind as to take her up and send her home, to said master shall be paid all costs and charges together with $2 reward for their troubles. Uh, this is from 1772. Thursday was apprehended, um, and she was ultimately sold again. Uh, we don't really know what happens to her after this. But from this ad, again, we can construct another micro-narrative that her size, perhaps she's been someone who's dealt with poor nutrition because four and a half feet tall is pretty small for that time period. Um, again, through the description of her body, through her clothing, we could sort of see that a lump above her right eye, perhaps she's been the victim of abuse, that her narrative is, again, a little bit different. One I wanted to talk about as well, as we get into where we find narratives about enslaved folks, is the story of Rose Welch. Has anyone heard of Rose Welch before? No? Okay. <coughs> I actually wrote a blog post about Rose Welch uh, a couple years ago. Um, so enslaved, uh, fugitive slave ads, those are one way in which we can discover information to construct slave narratives. Sometimes we have to look in different spots. And the story of Rose Welch is actually one that comes from the diary of Simeon Perkins. Perhaps folks, if you're from here, or you work with loyalists, uh, not obviously with actual loyalists, but work on loyalists, um, you've perhaps heard of Simeon Perkins. He is a merchant, military leader, uh, politician, judge, kind of jack of all trades in Liverpool. And he pretty much knows everybody in Nova Scotia, it sort of feels like, by reading his diary. And he is very odd in his attitudes towards slavery and enslavement. He is both simultaneously someone who um, has held people in slavery. We know this about uh, a child named Frank that he takes on as a uh, little guy's about 10 when Perkins um, takes ownership of him. We know that how he treats Frank is much more in line with being an apprentice, but at the end of the day, Frank is still held by Simeon Perkins. Um, we know that this is someone who, at the end of his life, doesn't own slaves. And we also know that this is a guy who facilitates a biracial marriage. So he's kind of all over the map with his attitudes towards um, towards uh, black folks in Liverpool area. And the story of Rose Welch is one that is interesting because even though he is recording what she says to him, it's still her words. So within his diary, um, we learn that Rose Welch is a woman who is kept by a man named Benaja Collins, who is by all accounts a very not nice person. Um, we know that she stands accused of murdering her newborn child, and she is about to be put on trial uh, by a three-judge panel. Benaja Collins is one of the men who will be hearing the, the case as her, the judge, and Perkins intercedes and has a judge brought down from Halifax who hears the case, and ultimately um, Rose is found not guilty. So. Um, I'm just going to read the passage from the Perkins Diary that talks about, um, that's basically encapsulates Rose's words. Um, so this is from the third volume of his diary. He, there are five. He was a very prolific writer. Yeah, like, there are like 25 actual diaries, if you can get the Queens County Museum to let you look at them, but they won't. 
Um, anyhow, so Perkins records that she confessed that she was the mother of the child found and that she was delivered alone in her chamber about sunset and that the same night she laid the child in the tide's way, that she did not do anything to kill it, nor did she perceive any life in it, that she had the child near a fortnight before she was taken up, and when she was examined before, she was afraid and ashamed to own it, but now she was neither afraid nor ashamed to own the truth. So, again, their words told through a third party, but from this we can see, um, I was speaking to someone last night, I don't know who you are now, uh, but the placing of a body in a, a river, like what happened in this instance, was very much an African death ritual. So we can see that even through the transportation, the kidnappings from Africa, that elements of African culture still took root here in Nova Scotia and were, were part of life for enslaved people. Um, we don't really know what happens to Rose afterwards besides the fact that she is not executed, which is basically what was going to happen. She is found not guilty. The townspeople are not happy about this, but ultimately her life is, is saved. The last person I wanted to talk about, um, Candina, you briefly glossed over her, but she's an awesome figure. Barbary Cuffey, have we heard of this woman before? Perhaps. If we haven't, you should know Barbary Cuffey is thought to be the first black woman eligible to vote in the province of Nova Scotia. She was a landowner in Liverpool in the 1770s. Unfortunately, she does leave Liverpool. We have no idea what happens to her. David States has worked extensively on Barbary Cuffey. Uh, she is an absolutely fascinating character. She's also the local midwife in uh, in Liverpool, and it's said that uh, she was the part of the inspiration for Aminata in um, the Book of Negroes, in the fictitious uh, version of the, the Book of Negroes. So what's interesting about Barbary Cuffey is the fact that she, her daughter Deborah, is, um, is married to a white man. She marries a white man in the 1770s. So I wanted to end with kind of a positive note, which is something I always like to do in my classroom when we're talking about kind of such, such hard topics, is that there is still agency amongst black folks who are living in Nova Scotia. Deborah Cuffey decided she loved John Carroll. She is living with John Carroll. She doesn't care that he's a white man. He doesn't care, well, I'm assuming so, that she is a black woman. They are living their lives. They are then approached by the community. I guess maybe they, maybe they was living in sin quote unquote, because uh, they are approached by the local minister and they uh, are asked, hey, do you want to be married to one another? And they're like, yep, this is it for me. And they're actually married and Simeon Perkins is a witness to this marriage. So even in this time frame, uh, Deborah Cuffey is, she is a free black woman and she has agency. She decides she is going to marry this man because she loves him, assumedly. And that's it. And she does what exactly she is going to do. And you have to admit that this is a pretty brave thing given the fact that in the US as an example, the loving case doesn't even come about until the 20th century. And she's doing this in the 18th century. It's pretty impressive. Ex just another example of how by looking through different sources we can create help kids build narratives about black history, which is inclusive and really more accurate. It gives a more accurate portrayal of what Canadian history is. It is multifaceted. It involves more than just white people. It involves black people, indigenous people, all other people of color, all of the different, different ethnic groups who've moved to this area. And all of those are equally important and deserve equal representation in our curriculum. And yeah, that's all I've got. Thank you very much. So I think I, I think I was fast. Or I might even nail it. What? Oh, there we go. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, 
So we're going to wrap up our session a little bit early today. Um, maybe I'll go home and get a good rest. Uh, but first, I wanted to start uh, this our closing remarks by thanking our lovely presenters. Uh, Robin, I, I thought this was super fascinating. I, too, agree, and I think we can all agree, that using primary sources in the classroom is the best way to teach often. So thank you. And Bashir, I, uh, I was very intrigued by your presentation, uh, listening along. I did my formative education in the West End of Edmonton, and I too remember learning the Cadillac Ranch, um, but I do not re remember learning any of what you talked about, and that is really sad. Um, so I hope, uh, it's been a while since I've been in the school system there, but I, I hope in the future these things can change. And Evan, um, thank you. This, it was really fascinating learning about the, the Black United Front's presence in Nova Scotia and that the civil rights movement existed here too. Because um, from you know, a lot of understanding that that was like, something that happened in the United States uh, and that Nova Scotia is not taking an active part in that. And that is incorrect, uh, so thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who came for our very, like our, our first set of panels. Uh, we'll reconvene tomorrow morning. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists, uh, they'll be kind of around for a few moments afterwards. But again, thank you so, so much. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.